So hi all, uh, welcome back to the Data Science Learning Community Book Club for Advanced R. We are finishing up the module on meta programming, and I have a particular interest in this where we're going to translate our code. As you can see, our learning objectives is to look at what are called domain-specific languages, and we're going to aid operability between R, HTML, and LaTeX. And along the way, of course, where we are in the textbook, we wish to reinforce better programming concepts such as expressions, quasi quotation, and evaluation. To just say that in another way, I made a quick flow chart. We'll be looking at this meta programming, and then we'll touch upon how this will affect our communication with HTML or LaTeX. What I'm thinking of is, as a teacher, making multiple choice questions. We are going to use our code to generate the HTML or LaTeX code to produce multiple choice questions, such as this. From calculus, what is the derivative of the function? And we have four choices there. In particular, this is a ordered list, a nested ordered list, some bold text, and some math text along with some functions, whether it's no mathematical functions or something we just call F, along with some Greek letters. And also because of the way we want to present the HTML, I tossed in a picture as well. So as developers, we might be asking ourselves, what are the expressions? What are the symbols? And will we have to quote inputs from the user where the user would be a math teacher? So what we're gonna to try to do uh, for the multiple choice question I just showed, we're gonna to try to reproduce this HTML. So once again, we have an ordered list, a nested ordered list, some bold, some math. In particular, in HTML, uh, beyond the tags for body, most of the tags have a beginning and an ending. That applies to the ordered list, that applies to the list items, and so forth. Now, if someone doesn't already know HTML and we don't want to have them go through all that overhead of learning it, what we're hoping to do instead is to have this domain-specific language that feels more like R but then we'll bridge the gap towards HTML programming. So once again, we have open order list, open and close, list item, open and close, and so forth. Now, in the textbook, et cetera, we want to point out that tags such as boldface have attributes. And this is especially useful for those of you who do web scraping. You want to be in a habit of having query defined attributes in case you want to make that easier for those who come after you. As I mentioned before, some most tags have a beginning and an ending, but there are also some void tags, which are just on their own. Now, in the HTML text, when we're doing these conversions, we want to worry about these open and closed brackets or angle brackets. So we're going to have to escape these characters. When we escape those characters, ampersands will pop up. So then we have to escape that as well. We stated we need to escape these three characters. But just in case, we are later going to apply some recursion, and we don't want things to happen in some senses over and over again. Once we escape these characters once, we don't need to escape them again. So we guys got to double check that we're not doing some sort of double escape. And then furthermore, in that vein, if the code is already written in HTML, just leave it alone. So what we're going to do is treat the HTML output that we want 
as an S3 class, we're going to do this through a little bit of object-oriented programming. The, the usual startup constructor, give it a class name, advanced R, HTML. And in particular, we're, at the end, we're going to be focused on using a ditch patch version of the print function for the polymorphism of it all. At, at first, what it does is just reminds the, the user, oh, by the way, this is HTML code, and then has some specificity here for a, a little bit of recursion in, in case you have nested code, such as nested list. Admittedly, I don't remember too much of this part here, so if there are any more questions, feel free. We're going to make a generic function called escape. And along the way, this is will help us escape the characters that we need to in those three that we mentioned before. So Sorry, far, I'm going to ask what... about that. Wait, um, sure. it's interesting because I think about escaping as like putting a backslash before something. And this is like changing the symbol to the HTML code for it or something. That's how you escape in HTML. I think this is like HTML escaping. You I can see. also escape some character in R. This is what you refer. But then other language are other way of escaping some special characters. Huh. So uh, when you talk about the backslash, that's how you escape in R, absolutely. Yeah. And this is just how you would escape in HTML. And is it weird at all to do a G sub of and, and then like, I mean, when we do G sub of the less than, we create an and character. So is it gonna then gonna try to escape that and character? You just gotta do the ampersand first. Yeah. Yeah, the percent is here to, to, to do that, but also like here we are just passing string for now. Right. Okay. Is it clear? I don't think we answer your question well. No, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. I'm just having order that. matters in this one exactly yeah, for sure, and that's sure. also why we'll get into. I think what Derek is going to get into next is like the recursiveness and how we have to know what's already been escaped because otherwise you'll escape every ampersand again, you exactly. know, over and over and over again. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've done that before in the past <laughs> with uh, slashes or something. It was right. Scary. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, and thank you for that discussion. Um, I completely agree with, with all you said. Simply reading off a little bit more from the textbook, if you have regular text, it gets returned by the functions that we have so far, implying that we have an HTML object. As you said, with the greater than or less than signs, they get escaped as such, and the ampersand gets escaped as such. If we apply the escape function again, this greater than gets escaped as the greater than HTML. But as you said, it's written in such a way that this ampersand is not then converted a second time. So as long as this part here is already deemed HTML, this part will not be escaped again. And then in general, if we have an HTML object, HT uh, escape will not do anything to it. So what I'm thinking is I want to take a, a line of text like this. What is the derivative of that function? I want this to be a list object. I want to have some math mode. And I want this particular word to be in bold. The issue is that we have some regular text and we have some other, um, loosely speaking, symbols for now to treat differently. And arguably the clever part of this chapter is to treat these, what we will later call HTML tags as named components. Way back in our chapter about vectors, I believe we have a named list available to us. Now, because we don't know how long the input HTML will be or how nested or how complex it is, we'll make a pretty uh, flexible dots partition here. And I believe someone in the recent chapters talked about 
the implementation of a list two. Otherwise, the rest of this for now is simply dividing up the items into something called named and unnamed. You'll see it below and using some logicals to keep track of that. But while we're here, did anybody want to have provide more insight on list two and how this is done? I was actually, you 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 anticipated my question. I was just going to ask everyone, I believe that list two right now isn't necessary at this phase unless we are expecting to bang, bang, operator, anything going into it later on. Is that right? So like we're, we're doing list two in anticipation of needing to um, unquote things in future. Right. That's my that's my understanding because yeah. at the end of the day you want your function to be flexible, no? Yeah. So like if uh in the if we end up partition, I'm just partition. If we ever I put it in the chat there, if we use the dots partition function with that bang bang operator, that's why we need list two. Awesome. Thank it's, you for the recommendation. I mean, I, I'm also asking. <laughs> not, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that was my chapter. And I think that was something I struggled with to, to try to like figure out when do we need list two. And it has to do with what happens outside of the function, which I think is kind of um, a little bit of a the reversal of how I think of it sometimes. But anyway, well, I presumably we'll, we'll see. Yes, that all falls in line. Uh, for now, I just created this quick example of what DOS partition is somewhat doing. Here I have a vector with posit RStudio, DSLC, and cohort line. In particular, I gave two of them actual names. So you'll notice that the named elements are here and the unnamed elements are here. For lack of a better phrasing, I have elevated the status of these particular labels. In the textbook, there is some use of some code in the background, and you have to dig into the GitHub repository to grab it. I just went ahead and put that here in, in the slides. So there are notions called HTML tributes. It's probably something we don't have to really mention here, but it, it does some of the escaping and, and the like. So remember in HTML, when you want to make something bold or you want to make a list, those items in the in the angle brackets are called tags. We're going to treat these tags as functions, but to the best of my knowledge, we're using the new function to maintain that these are function calls. We're going to have arguments of this new functions and then be particularly concerned about how to make the expression. The textbook, of course, did, in my opinion, a good job of explaining things. I simply added the explanations as comments to the code, so that way we could just see them together. We're going to classify the tags as these named components that we saw on the previous slides. We're going to focus on the named components. But then otherwise, we're going to kind of assume the rest are treated as nested code and bring along that escape generic function if we need to still use it to convert from text to HTML. And can I ask, just to make sure I understand. So, and the reason why we're doing this is because the name components we're assuming have already been escaped and we don't want to escape them again. Is, is that it or? Not quite yet. We Okay. I don't think. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Continue. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then, as you were mentioning, uh, bang, bang, my baby shot me dead. We need to, what is this, unquote some of the arguments that come from the pasting. We have the opening, the tag name, whatever is inside the tag, which would be attributes, then the closing bracket. Mm -hmm. Anything inside the the tags namely the nested code, and then the ending tag. 
And then finally, as usual in R, the last item is what's returned and we're returning the environment. I probably did skip over something. So any more discussion on this part? No, I, I was just gonna say, I just realized I got confused about the um, named versus unnamed things because they're they're all part of the same HTML tag and just parts of it are describing the tag and parts of it are the code contained by the tag. Sorry, I think that's where I was getting a bit confused. That's good. And the point of this function is to create HTML tags. Is that the idea here? Yes, yeah, so that way whatever is deemed an HTML tag, we could have it in like the object oriented sense be be treated in a, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So you're not creating it, it already exists, but we're treating we, it in a certain way. We are creating the class, we're going to construct the tags in a bit. Okay, we're creating a class. Okay, okay. It's a function that generates function. <laughs> the function factory also. Right. Okay. So you don't need to reproduce like. Yeah. And then the stuff for the void tags, the the singular tags that are, again, just not the starting and ending tags. Similar, we want to maintain this as a function call, allow for a lot of expressions, care for it. Const construct the expressions. It's it's just that we only have the one tag this time and return the caller environment. And if yeah, I, I wasn't like, really completely yeah. sure why you need to make sure that you have attributes in the tag or why you have the error checking here, but at the least it's probably useful for the web scrapers. Uh, also like you could have arcade, you could just have racket one function with a specific argument that said void or not instead of making two. Uh, but I think making, I, I don't know if making two is better. Like I have no good idea. Cause like the code is very similar to the other one. Just have a switch. I think I'd let, usually prefer like to split stuff in function instead of having functions that do multiple stuff. But it could also have been a consideration. Yes, but if we're doing functional programming, we're say later on we're going to put this in a in a map or a walk. It might yeah. be used for separate functions. Makes sense. So, for example, the order this tag, we could now create that. It will start the order this attributes bracket whatever is inside the order list, and then the ending tag. I found this at least intellectually curious for the image tag, if I put nothing here, or sorry, nothing here, there was no error on my end, but no output as well. But if I use the image tag as intended, then it'll, it'll create all the HTML code. That's interesting because it was supposed, I guess the error picked up whether or not there was unnamed arguments, not whether there was no arguments. So there was just, and if there's no arguments, there's no tag to make. So maybe that's um, that's how come it didn't work with no arguments. Okay, thank you. What's my guess? <laughs> I guess I guess the next check would have been to put it an error check if there's no if like the length of dots is zero, then error. You know, you need to have something in here. <laughs> yes, and that kind of surprised me as well because if you're doing any sort of recursion, there's probably got to be a careful base case. No, actually, I take it back because some void tags don't have arguments. So like br and is a no. void tag that has no arguments, right? Only like image does, but a lot of them are just like they just do a thing. Um, so you have if you're going to be making function factory, so you can just churn out a bunch of these. You're going to have the I think the the um, flip side. You, it's faster and easier and less coding, but you're maybe a little bit more limited in how many sort of checks and balances you can do. All right, so we'll process the tags now. I took a moment to make this Venn diagram. Please excuse the uppercase. It was just a quick teacher app that assumed everything you wanted was an uppercase. Just assumed everything's in lowercase. 
there are various tags that you use in HTML on the left side. We are familiar with various tags that we use in R on the right side. The issue is that amongst programming languages, some things are used twice, such as the word table, such as the word summary. So briefly, the people making this R to HTML domain specific language needed to address that. What do you mean by tags on the right side? Like, why is help a tag? What does that mean? It's a function in R, but- Oh, sorry, yeah. How do I think about it as a tag? Sorry, yeah, you're right, functions. I think oh, so the tags so in HTML have corresponding functions in R. Yep. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So if I you can... if you create one, it oh, R will pick the one that you created first, then we'll overwrite it. I mean, not exactly overwrite it, but it, right. the namespacing will go for the one you created. So some of the tags that we can encounter in HTML are these, uh, and some of the void tags, as you've been mentioning, are these. The issue is that if we are trying to convert to HTML, we want to treat words like summary as HTML and not R. And in my opinion, the clever trick is to elevate those names as using the dplyr set names function. And now that these are named variables, we could just have this workaround so that way we could tell whatever to not treat this as R. And there's your map function for tag and void tag. So for example, we could make some of the list now with the HTML tags, order this list item, the bold face, and it's building the, the nested nature of the HTML code. So in the in the one above the HTML tags <clears throat> code block, you're piping the the names, the functions into map tag. But you're saying that when you do that piping on some of the words they don't pipe. Can you explain that again? The the line that goes from set names to map tag. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, all we're doing is making sure that those HTML tags are named. And if they're named, they don't become tags. What What does the naming do again? I think it's actually to create a list of functions that are named by what the function is. Um, if you go back there to the slide we were on, um, so set names will set, if you don't give it a name to set, it just sets it to itself. I believe. Yeah. And so you're taking like the character vector of all the tags and you're saying, okay, set these names to themselves. So then you have a named character vector, which is like, you know, UL equals UL. So it's yeah. pretty, yeah. and then it's, um, mapping those into tags so that you end up with a named list of the functions. I think that's the only reason why you set the names is so that you can call it by name later. Uh, uh, on the example on HTML tags dollar sign $OL, this will not be valid if your uh, vector was not named. Exactly, yeah. Okay, but So this is not getting around that intersection problem. Yes, it is. How how what how is the intersection related to this? Because That's no, opinion. you are not like let's say like you have summary instead of all. No, you are reference summary by HTML tag summary and not summary. So the right. summary function still refers to the R function, and you have to if you want to use the summary tag, you have to first go inside the list HTML tags to get access yep. to it. But but we're doing that for all the functions. Yep. Mm -hmm. Not just the ones in the intersection. Exactly. Okay. 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 Yep. Yes. Everything in the left circle here. Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 All right. So with all that said, we're going to bring everything together. This is probably much more dense than it looks. With HTML, this is literally just converting our text to HTML. Plug in some code. We're going to in closure it 
which was what variables and environment, but also have the HTML tags around. And then finally, eval tidy because we're dealing with closures. That was me just obviously not doing the reading. <laughs> but then finally, at least for me, I was able to plug in the R version, domain specific language into this with HTML function. And I got mostly what I wanted back out of it. Which is this here, which is pretty much everything except for the Greek letters and some of the math stuff. But again, I skipped a bunch of details right at the top. So did anybody want to discuss that? Can I reiterate what I think it means? And you guys tell me if I'm right. I feel like it's one of those things where I think I understand, but I feel better if I can explain it to you guys and have you <laughs> confirm. So Please. eval tidy allows us to evaluate the first argument in the context of like a data mask or an environment. And in this case, our data mask is the list HTML tags. So we're saying in, in quote, the code and then evaluate this code in the context of this list. And that means that we don't actually have to, that's why with the, in the example there, we don't actually have to, ref, we can refer, sorry, we can refer to the functions as the functions themselves, even though they don't exist outside of that list, because we're saying everything's done within the context of this list. So body now exists just as an, as the function body. Right. Not yeah, as HTML tags, dollar sign body. And that means to understanding HTML tags, just a bunch of function uh, that we're going to use to eval. And we are unquoting because like uh, what we're going to pass is like our expression. Like the body, H1, all of that is, we are just going to read it as an expression. We don't want to, I mean, it just does not want to be evaluated. We want to evaluate it in the other stuff. That's right. how you understand it. Yes, that's why you have to encode it first so yeah. that it doesn't get evaluated until it's in the the little new world we're creating for it that also has the HTML tag functions. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's exactly true or I evaluate stuff, but I always have the substitution substitution model in my mind. So if you didn't have quad, it's gonna go, just going to try to do body, H1, yes. and stuff like that. It's going to and do body, it's, it's not going to be able to find body because it's looking for it in the main environment. And then, yes. And... Okay, good. That's my understanding, at least. I don't know if Ozo has a... Can yes, you that sounds... a little bit, Derek, just so we can see the end of this? Oh, I don't... That's not going to do it for me. So now I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what, what are we looking at? I, I want to see this, but I wanted you to scroll up, not make it smaller. <laughs> oh, just watch the top. I, I want to see the bottom of the main example. Can you show the whole example? Yeah. There you go. There you go. Uh, uh, yeah, just just the code part, and I don't need to. Yeah, yeah. It. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question if about... Um, has anyone worked with like Shiny or HTML tools? I was just thinking this because Shiny does the same thing where you go, you know, if you want to put text into your Shiny app, you have to go BR parentheses. Or like P or, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can use HTML too, I think. Oh, some stuff. Some stuff. Um, it, it's mm, sometimes. It depends yeah. a little bit on, on because sometimes they actually escape the HTML. So it doesn't, it, it sometimes it protects things. So it does, you don't always get the, the code evaluated as a tag. Um, but yeah, sorry, when I saw all this, all I could think of was my Shiny apps. Um, but in Shiny, it, it comes from the HTML tools package. So they have all these, but they also have in HTML tools, the tags like list. And so HTML tools has like P to make a paragraph and it has like A to make a link and image, I believe to make an image. Uh, no, no, probably wouldn't have that. But anyway, it has all these other things, but there's a whole bunch of generic tags that you can't access by the function name and you have to go tags dollar sign the function name and it's frustrating because the documentation because i think they're created kind of like that you, you can't always 
um, you don't always get a list of all, or, or do you here? Sorry, I'm going to look that up before I say that. Oh, you totally get a list of all. The, no, you don't. The tag function creates any tag that you might want. So I think it allows you just to kind of arbitrarily create HTML tags that might be relevant to you. And can they you, do have the image tag. Sorry. Can you do things inside of things? Like, like it, let's say that H1, you just wanted the word quiz to be emphasized like EM. Yeah. So you yeah. could, you could uh, nest B, no? You can nest the bold function. Uh-huh. In H1. Right, 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 yeah. right, right. So on the teacher side of things, what I was envisioning is that I would just need to tell a teacher to have a data frame with text like this, and then some choices in a column, and then otherwise just build a helper function to, to help out with these tags. And yeah, but here you need a list. You can't really like, the data frame will be very complicated, no? You want the list structures. This is why you use map somewhere. I don't remember I was going to say, yeah. Yep. And then on a teacher point of view, like have a function that could also randomize your choices. So that way the correct mm -hmm. answer is not always. I like correct. that. I like that. Mm -hmm. Also, just, just from, this is, this just is just an illustration because you know that doing that in Quarto would be much, much, much simpler. Yes. <laughs> okay. Good. Just making sure. <laughs> Sorry. There also, it's, it's a little bit, my spouse has used some, I can't remember if they're latex packages or R packages, honestly, but that, that do like randomizing for like multiple choice and stuff. But I think in the end, it was just like more trouble than it was worth. But um, we did spend a long time. He's a professor of at automating all of his like uh, assignments for his <laughs> students. And uh, even his course syllabi are all like automated with like all the, he had just put in like the starting dates and, and when the holidays are and stuff like that and, and everything just. And his letters of recommendation too. <laughs> that's a great idea that'll be the next one <laughs> <laughs> um okay i have a question derek so you have this function here or you have this call to the function with html and then i can see below in this like commented out how the html code is generated using this which with html but i'm sort of curious about now the below part so it, it, is 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 the difference like in the first chunk, you did eval equals false, and in the second one, you did eval equals true. Like, if you evaluate it, then it does. Does that make sense? What I'm asking. Oh, so you put that in there. So yeah, can you so thanks to the Slack channel, I asked um, someone how to do this, and June answered in like five minutes. Can you scroll up a tiny bit? Could you so, not? Okay, so you get that output, and then you copy paste it into the HTML chunk. Yes. Could you uh, not also just put it bare, like without the back ticks, like with in that check section? Could you get rid of the tick 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 equals HTML? I think this is better. I, I'm I'm gonna say officially, I think this is much better than just doing that. But I think you can also just delete the code block and leave the code, and it yeah. should render as HTML. Yeah, right. if you remove the HTML. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're first. you're right. You're right. It would. Yeah, but I actually really like this because I feel like that um, is a little bit truer to the spirit of like RMD and, and QMD and stuff like that, where you have different outputs. And so this one won't be weird if you were to try and make a PDF of it. It wouldn't give you what you want, but it it, uh, it uh, would be appropriate. Yeah. Also, like it's kind of using a, the, 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 the option, like you pass the HTML code into the markdown document. It's kind of using a hack. So... I believe the HTML chunk will work on PDF. While if you want to render uh, the first one on PDF, it will probably just print the PDF. Uh, it will probably just print the, um, mm -hmm. the stuff because you your engine will just go like Markdown with um, PenDoc that just or LaTeX and are just gonna generate the the PDF. While with the HTML a chunk you used, I think it will render correctly in PDF. Okay. Yes, in general, just making things more programmatic. Yeah. yeah. Which the, the, the first trick is like, it's going to work on HTML because uh, Air Markdown transform Markdown to Markdown, then Markdown to HTML. Mm. 
So folks, we have 20 minutes left for the second half of the chapter. I'm probably going to talk kind of fast through the next few slides and we could come back to the details. All right, LaTeX, basically what us uh, math, physics, et cetera, folks use to type math formulas. Similarly, build an S3 object and have a dispatch for the printing of the LaTeX code. Start off by telling the user that we have LaTeX and then um, collapse it just in case there's some nested code. Overall, I want a two math function. Um, this is not being run right now, just this is as a preview. We're going to um, in, induce an expression, return the LaTeX code from the S3 class. This was new to me, eval bear to ensure the use of the LaTeX environment. And I'm thinking that's to avoid the use of the global environment. We're dealing with expressions, not closures because like you mentioned earlier, you have to be careful about what gets evaluated. And then we have to use that particular LaTeX environment. And basically the rest of the chapter is defining what we meant by the LaTeX environment. So the way I slightly reordered this, we have known symbols, known functions, unknown symbols, unknown functions, and then we'll bring this together. The known symbols, the prime example of the Greek letters. So in LaTeX, here they are. Some of them are capitalized, some of them are not. Some of them are hard to read compared to English. So you have a, var a variant as well. And as we were mentioning earlier, we could use set names to, in my opinion, elevate these. So that way they have both a name and their escaped, escaped version. because you're dealing with both R and LaTeX, you might have to escape the escape. Now for known functions, there are some unary functions which will put some user input on the left side of the expression and some user input on the right side of the expression. But you notice know, that we have to use the bang bang operators along the way for the quasi quotation. One example is square root, where you need in LaTeX the opening curly brace and the closing curly brace around whatever you have inside, whatever you're, mathematically you're trying to take the square root of. Binary operators are good old friend, the infix. We put that in between two expressions. So for example, the plus symbol, we have a couple of expressions putting the plus in between. And we're returning these as function calls. Now, if you were seriously doing this, trying to handle a lot of LaTeX options, you would have to talk about all the possible LaTeX functions or operators that we have there. For now, I copy and paste while it's in the textbook, add a little bit of trigonometry, but I, this is largely incomplete. A particular note of the fraction operator, putting something in a numerator, putting something in a denominator, that has to be carefully handled. Now, I renamed some of these functions to make a little bit more sense to me. So if you read the textbook, there'll be slightly different names here. I made a, called this names grabber. There was a switch expression towards the end of one of the previous chapters, and we might not have mentioned it in the book club. But for the most part, if whatever is being plugged is in a constant, treat as a character. If whatever is being plugged in is a symbol, also treat as a character. And then we're, we're trying to grab these function calls overall in a way that's recursive. So for example, at the bottom of the screen, I have some sort of mathematical expression. I ran the names grabber function on it, and then you could kind of get a sense of what we're calling the names here. And what we're not calling the names at the moment. So X, Y, A, B, C are names. F and 10 or not. 
Now, the textbook author noted that we could also relate this to the abstract syntax tree. We do not have to worry about taking up literal paper. So let's go ahead and look at that this way. And I'll pause here as well. So as you can see, what we, we're calling the names are these leaves of the abstract syntax tree that are not constants. Similarly, uh, we have a calls grabber to grab the unknown functions that are functions that are not like sine, cosine, and tangent. And we have the switch expression handling some of that for us. It's probably quicker just to see. I This time around, I called both names grabber and calls grabber on the expression that's on the top of the screen. I'll pause here so you could compare and contrast. Yeah, I understand why you try to rename some of the function to make it more easy to read. <laughs> so as you can see, by calls, we mean the function calls that we have in the abstract syntax tree as such. And then otherwise those leaves, their inputs are the names. Now from there, mathematically, uh, just like the result of a sudden breakup, we also seek closure, which will apply a math font to function names just to make the LaTeX output easier to read and also apply an ending parenthesis. Putting some of the call names, such as um, a function like F in the math Roman font, having the contents and then the ending parenthesis. Yeah, it, that, that, that making a lot of work, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, the coup de grace, bringing all this together, chances are I'm gonna describe something incorrectly, but just to try it. The LaTeX environment takes an expression for the unknown functions, such as the math functions, F and G, we're gonna get those with a call grabber. We're gonna map them to the seek closure function to again, just for the font and the closing parentheses. And we're gonna have a call environment. For the known functions, such as sine and cosine, we're gonna have an environment clone that will also include the above stuff. For the unknown symbols such as A, B, and C, we're going to have the names grabber get those in the environment, elevate those names, and this overall be a child of the above environment. And then for the known symbols such as pi and omicron, we're going to have an environment clone that's a child of the symbol environment above. This is all being, those four sections are all being brought together. And now that's the LaTeX environment that could be utilized in this implementation of the object-oriented programming. So to check that out, the textbook example, suppose I have sine of pi plus f of a. The two math function will con correctly convert this to LaTeX, including the known symbol the unknown symbol, the known function, and the unknown function. And that basically was the LaTeX side of things. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, no, good job, uh, Derek. I, I, I don't think it's a question. Is that something that I realized while reading that? It's like, even if I use HTML or I use LaTeX occasionally, I was not ready to build a data specific language. So I think like you need before building one, getting a very like that, that it's not appear in the book because that's not the question of the book, but it's, it's kind of transpire. Like uh, it, you need to understand well what you want to mimicate and also like the intricacy of your language to do it. And uh, you need to understand well LaTeX to build like a data specific language for LaTeX and also 
uh, yeah, because you need to, or uh, yeah, and map well what your language expression needs to the correct one. So I think this is like my take from also this chapter is like before building a data specific language, uh, understand well the, the not data sorry domain. Um, you need to understand the domain well. <laughs> so, dear, <clears throat> asking this same question about this, would you then take that output and um, just put it into dollar signs? Yes, that is possible. Or uh, or this, what else? Yes, exactly. This this would work. Um, I mean, yeah, I know it'll work, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah, you're right. I'm just curious if, if there's is there another option, or is that you the only to run it directly do with it? I'm not sure. Does anybody know? Does R have a chunk, a LaTeX chunk? Uh, R Magdon, yes. Yes, I think you can do the same thing we did with the HTML thing. Yeah. Just copy into something like that. In theory. Yeah. If you create a new chunk and try uh, with the engine LaTeX, should work. I don't know. A equal, probably. Something like equal. that. Equal. Yeah, you need the equal, I think, first. Yeah. And this is um this is Knitter probably. Oh my. I wonder. What are we gonna see? Other other one of my other take also of the chapter was like uh maybe before risking myself doing that, I should read the follow book that uh Adler recommend. That was like oh no. <laughs> no. Uh, it's not running correctly. I wonder if that's capitalized or something PDF? like that. The LaTeX. Um, I think you got to put it in dollar sign somehow. Yeah, if you put it in dollar sign, it will know. But like the dollar sign is doing that. It's no dollar sign is marked down to pipe to let uh, to to identify LaTeX. But uh, I don't know. Good question and. Yeah, but yeah, I completely agree. It would be nice to also have this done in a programmatic way. I think it exists. We just do not know about it. Yeah, I could ask in the Slack channel later. Maybe folks would know. Um, what was the? Well, I think you would write a function, right? That takes. I mean, you can write a function. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good way of solving it. You could write a function that just pass the dollar sign on both sides and escape them. And then if anybody's curious on the multiple choice front, I didn't finish it because I would have to <laughs> define the either array or enumerate environment. So I just gave myself a nice big to do there. No, that's fine. That <laughs> was a good chapter, no worries. Yeah. Um, so apparently um, the curly bracket equals HTML, I think is from Pandoc. Yeah. So I'm just trying to figure out what it is we're supposed to say for LaTeX. Yeah, this this adding complexity because like you have like multiple engine with uh, R Markdown and Quarto. I feel like my take home from this chapter was not to do this <laughs> and to find other people who have done it first and use what they had to struggle through. Um, I mean, but... just write in LaTeX. Oh. I'm so excited okay. for types. I'm so done with LaTeX. Um, so I, I I can't wait to see how types evolves. Have you guys heard of types? It's mm -hmm. like it's um it was it's just started being supported in Quarto, which is kind of cool. And it's a project that is essentially meant to not replace or be an alternative to LaTeX. And it was developed by a, essentially a group of PhD students who were just like, I am done with LaTeX. Like, why does it have to be so convoluted? Um, and so I'm, it, it's way nicer to work with. I've not worked with it very much, but the little bits and pieces I've done were like learning anything new is always like, you got to figure out the bits and pieces, but once you do, it's like, oh, it was really cool. I really liked it. No, like I was thinking also like related to um, like this chapter, like all ISP makes stuff way easier because just having a convention, like, you know, like the, the first um, expression, I mean, the first text after the parenthesis, the first parenthesis is always going to be the operators. 
and you are always in the prefix uh, mode. You are never having fix. So it's it's make a way easier to build a domain specific language because then you can just like uh, the the language make it easier. Mm. And I think some other R make it not that hard, but it's still harder. And I I do not know much enough language that could even make it harder because just the way like the trade off you have between like allowing you to do that domain specific language while being like nice, not having a bunch of parentheses and a weird language that's hard to read. So it's, it's probably some kind of trade-off also. But yeah, it was good chapter. Thanks, Derek. I don't know if it was uh, next week. We are uh, we are like um, eating pancakes and and, <laughs> and as a syro, uh, <laughs> relaxing from our Halloween. Right, relaxing <laughs> from the Halloween. candy candy high. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah. I just so want to put out there to this group that um, I really appreciate this and I'm going to keep going and I'm, and you know, whatever, but I'm, I'm not, I don't have the bandwidth to lead and I know there's some open spots and I want to apologize to you all that. I'm that not that's fine. Group, even though I know it's my turn and I'm sorry. Uh, that's, that's bandwidth. fine. I'm probably thinking I was looking at the chapters. We can probably consolidate one, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm letting that out. Uh, we're going to let a message, but I think the per, uh, evaluation or performance uh, can be linked together, I, but let, let, let's do that. Does not need to be like on the meeting, but uh, it can be done offline. But I think we can probably put together improving performance and or at least and the per, uh, measuring performance. So twenty three and twenty four. Yeah. yeah, and so also to put this out there, not... um, whoever is handling these chapters, some of those code chunks inherently might take a while to run, so you might need to cache your code and all that. Good points. So, yeah, good, very good points also. Diana, it looks like you signed up for the 29th. Do, do we want to say end, by the way, Olivier? Oh, shoot. 